Chapter 28, Assisting with Respiration and Oxygen Delivery. Okay, so breathing is the body's way of taking in oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. It also assists in maintaining acid-base balance on a short-term basis. So there are several structures in the respiratory system. We start with the nose and mouth. That's where we take in air through our nose and mouth. And then we go down to the pharynx and in the trachea, which com compose the upper airway. The trachea will then divide off into the right and left um, bronchi. We have two lungs. We have a right lung and a left lung. The left lung has two lobes and the right lung has uh, three lobes and in the lobes each uh, each lung rather uh, the bronchi the bronchi divide into bronchioles and they divide into alveoli and the alveoli is where the gas exchange takes place between oxygen and carbon dioxide also a part of the respiratory system is your diaphragm your diaphragm contracts and uh, relaxes. When it contracts, the diaphragm enlarges the thoracic cavity, which causes inspiration. And when the diaphragm relaxes, the thoracic cavity becomes smaller, which um, causes expiration. Um, another thing I want to make note of um, when you look at these structures to make note understand that the mouth and the pharynx is also involved in the digestive system as well. So several changes occur to our, um, our, our elderly population when we refer specifically to the respiratory system. Um, they have a decreased elasticity of their thorax and their respiratory muscles, so it's not as elastic. Their total body water decreases, so their mucous membranes are going to be drier. Um, loss of elastic recoil when e uh, during exhalation. Um, the alveolar uh, membrane also thickens, and so that lessens the effectiveness of gas exchange, that exchange of the O2 and CO2 and uh, less respiratory reserve. So with all these things um, taking place in our elderly patients, it makes them more vulnerable to develop um, acute infections in the respiratory tract. So colds, pneumonia, flu, things like that, that makes them more um, susceptible to developing um, those things. And now we have COVID, and so that was why they, you know, a reason they're considered a vulnerable population because they are so much more at risk for developing fact infections of the respiratory tract. Okay, so hypoxemia is considered decreased oxygen in the blood. So if we have decreased oxygen in the blood, that well, if, if it's not correct, it will eventually lead to decreased oxygen at the several at the cellular level, which is called hypoxia, uh, which in turn will result in an increase in our carbon dioxide levels, which is called hypercapnia. So hypercapnia, remember hyper in front of a word means excessive or more than, and hypo in front of a word means less than. So when we have things that can cause us to have hypoxia, a lot of different things can cause us to have hypoxia um, if you have a decrease in your neuromuscular function. So, for example, um, you've had a stroke, you've had um, brain trauma or something like that, um, excessive amount of sedatives, um, if you're in a coma, things like that. Some of your neurological diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre, those type things can cause us to have um, hypoxia. Um, pulmonary emboli. Pulmon uh, emboli is a blood clot that travels, so it may be developed in the extremities um, as a thrombus, and then it broke off and traveled to the lungs. If it travels to the lungs, it's called a pulmonary emboli. So if that's not resolved um, immediately, then a person could die with that um, blood clot in the lungs because that's 
um, you know, decreasing the oxygen level that can go out to, you know, to the cells, to the body or whatnot. Tumors that are blocking uh, a passage of oxygen and O2, I mean, O2 and CO2. Um, respiratory distress, you know, all these different things uh, can cause a person to develop hypoxia. So what are we going to see in our patient with hypoxia? We can see a lot of different things. Um, it can affect the brain. And so if it's affecting the brain, it could cause us to have um, uh, uh, impairment in our memory, impairment in our judgment, um, impairment in our intellectual abilities um, can all be impacted as well. Um, you might also see restlessness, irritability, confusion in that person. Uh, dyspnea. Remember, dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Start learning these different terms. When it's terms that you don't see, make sure you start to understand and learn those terms. So dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Tachypnea, which is rapid breathing. That's rapid or fast breathing. Um, uh, another thing, Strider. Strider is, and we'll talk about, um, we've talked about that um, in lab, but Strider is when you have uh, something that's blocking the airway passage and um, you can't get air in. So it's like, uh, uh, it's on inspiration. That's a sound like that you might hear on inspiration because something's blocking that airway passage. Maybe it's swollen. Maybe we got something physically in there that's blocking um, airway passage. So that strider can occur. And so if we're not getting air in, that can cause hypoxia. Um, you know, another term you need to know, cyanosis. Cyanosis is if you have so much um, hypoxia, this will be a late sign that you, your, skin your skin or your mucous membranes become blue tinged. That's called cyanosis. Um, you'll see some acid-base imbalances, and we'll talk about different acid-base imbalances as well um, when we get to the fluid and electrolyte chapters and show you how to determine different fluid um, uh, acid-base imbalances. Um, so your blood gases can tell you a, a how severe that hypoxia might be. Um, they'll have a decreased oxygen saturation, so that pulse ox, that would be... Um, greatly decreased as well. Um, you know, uh, retractions. Retractions are when the muscles are moving inward on inspiration. So um, the chest muscles uh, moving inward on uh, respirations. They could also have dysrhythmias. Dysrhythmias are an irregular heartbeat. So there's a lot of different things you might see in a patient with hypoxia. So hypoxia is treated by giving oxygen and by correcting the cause. So whatever the issue is, if the issue is something's blocking the airway, obviously we need to correct that issue um, to allow air to enter, you know, the person. So whatever the issue is, we need to correct that and then giving them um, oxygen. Our nursing interventions, we need to keep the people away from um others with respiratory infections because the patient is at in, that has an increased risk for um, developing an infection. So you want to keep them away from others that have respiratory infections. Okay, pulse oximetry, um, that's an indirect measurement of the oxygen level in the blood. So you might see it as um, SpO2. And so it can also be included as part of the respiratory evaluation if the patient is at risk for or actually is experiencing some type of respiratory distress or something. A pulse oximeter and the correct probe are needed um, if you're measuring the oxygen saturation uh, levels. And so the most common sites um, obviously are fingers. Uh, you can use the fingers, the earlobes. Um, the toes, uh, infants, they might use the foot. Uh, the site has to be free of moisture and have good circulation. You want to remove any nail polish if you're using the fingers or the toes. Um, if the person is wearing like acrylic nails or gel nails or something like that, you might want to find an alternate site 
and so you're going to um uh when you document you want to document um the percent so say it's um 95 percent and you want to say are they on room air or are they on oxygen if they're on oxygen you say the amount and the route so for example 95 percent um on room air or 95 percent on two liters oxygen via nasal cannula or via uh, six liters via face mask or whatever the issue whatever the situation may be um you know some other things that can impact it you know their hemoglobin level can impact what their o2 level will be um the temperature of the site um because you know hypothermia can cause vasoconstriction and if they're on oxygen obviously that can you know impact it or whatever and so um Okay, choking is um, another common issue that can impact our airway and ability to um, and ability to breathe. Um, a lot of different things can cause us to choke: obstruction of our tongue, or some type of foreign body, such as or or food, or you know, little ones. They can put anything in their mouths or whatever. Um, or food, you know, can be a common uh, cause of choking. And, you know, the universal sign for choking, uh, there's actually a diagram in your book. But if the person, you know, has their hands around their neck and, you know, as if they're, they're gasping um, for air or whatnot. And so, um, you know, a couple of different things, you know, we can do. Obviously, if they're, um, you know, still up and, and coughing. We want to, you know, encourage them to keep coughing. You know, if they can talk, coughing, you know, it's going to be an effective way for them. Forcefully coughing is going to be an effective way for them to try to clear those secretions if they're able to. If they're not able to, then adults, we may need to do uh, the Heimlich maneuver. And so um, to try to clear <clears throat> their passages. So um, we want to ask the person. Um, you know, see, you know, see if they can speak and verify if the person is choking or whatever. If they're unable to speak and cough effectively, then we can do the Heimlich maneuver. And to do that, you want to stand behind the person and place your arms around the person halfway between the umbilicus and the uh, xiphoid process. And then with one hand forming a fist and the other over the fist, uh, with an upward motion, forcefully thrust the hands into the abdomen at an upward angle, trying to force that um, out, um, whatever the, the object may be out. And then, um, you know, obviously, then if they, you know, pass out at that point, we have to go into CPR. Um, but for our infants, we want to do the five blows between the, the uh, shoulders to try to clear the, the passage as well. So another issue that may occur with our patients um, is increased secretions that can cause um, our patients to also have hypoxia because it's preventing the exchange of oxygen. And so uh, the simplest method of clearing the air passages is, is to cough effectively. And so deep breathing and coughing um, are two standard measures that can be used to clear the secretions. So you want to have your patient take two deep breaths and then uh, and inhale deeply and then have them breathe rapidly and forcibly um, to ex and exhale and try to, you know, cough up those um, secretions. So the deep breathing increases oxygenation and opens up the alveoli and um, and hopefully that can, you know, precipitate the, the coughing um, in your patients and trying to help them clear the secretions out. Okay, postural drainage is um, something that's also that can be used to assist patients to cough up secretions. So typically in your inpatient settings, the respiratory therapist is the um, 
person that'll be doing this postural drainage. But in home settings, it could very well be the nurse, um, you know, doing it, teaching the patient to uh, and their family members to do it in the, uh, you know, in the community setting or whatnot. And so uh, what it does is um, the person is put in um, different positions. So if you look in your book, that figure 28.3, you can see the different positions that the person may be um, put in for this um, uh, to prepare for, you know, the postural drainage. And so what the, the, then the person will, with cuffed hands, they're going to, uh, in a cuffing motion, um, pat in each area of the uh, chest wall to try to loosen up those secretions so that the person can uh, try to cough up the secretions. Um, a lot of times they'll use a nebulizer beforehand to try to uh, loosen up the secretions, uh, you know, before doing the, the postural drainage. But like I said, most of the time, uh, if you're in an inpatient setting, you'll have your resp respiratory therapist that will be doing these procedures. You want to make sure you're auscultating the lungs before and after the procedure to see how effective the procedure may have been. Okay, question two, Bruce's patient is showing early signs of hypoxia. Which of the following signs is not an early sign of hypoxia? The answer here is four, cyanosis. So remember, cyanosis is a late sign of hypoxia. So pay attention to your questions. Um, do they ask for early signs? Do they ask for late signs? All of those. Um, may be signs of hypoxia. However, the question said, which one is not an early sign? And so cyanosis is a late sign of respiratory um, insufficiency. And so all the rest of those um, will be considered early signs. Okay, so oxygen is a colorless, tasteless, odorless gas that's present in um, the air. It's essential for life. And if a person or your patient cannot maintain a sufficient amount of oxygen in the body, then supplemental oxygen is ordered. So uh, remember, oxygen is still considered a medication. And so you do have to have an order um, for oxygen. And your orders, you know, should say what do we want to maintain our O2 sats um, between or above or um, what's how much oxygen, what route we're going to give the oxygen, and we're going to talk about the different routes here um, in a minute. So it is essential to life, um, you know, however, it can uh, be a danger, it can cause fires to burn very rapidly. It's also very drying. Um, to the respiratory tract. So that's why um, many times you'll see humidification added to the oxygen as well because it can be very drying to the respiratory tract. Okay, so we have different routes of um, administration for of oxygen, different ways we can administer our oxygen. And if you look in your book, figure 28.8 provides different pictures, and then table 28.3 provides um, uh, different rationales for each. You can see you've got your nasal cannula. Now, if you need a lower um, dose, just a small dose of um, oxygen, you know, one to five liters, maybe six possibly, you can use um, just a simple nasal cannula, which are the nasal prongs in the nose um, for these individuals. Um, so these people can be a little bit more mobile um, and do a little bit, a little more things um, with it. They can eat, they can still talk and, you know, uh, walk around if they have the, you know, the uh, portable tank and things like that. So these are lower doses. You got to also keep in mind with these um, nasal cannulas, making sure you're checking behind the ears for skin breakdown and things like that as well. 
if we need something higher than that um if we're going to like six to 12 liters we want to probably go to a simple face mask um, for individuals that need a higher dose um, because that nasal cannula will not be able to um, provide that higher dose individuals needing um, even more than that you can go to a partial rebreather which will give you um, higher concentrations between 40 to 60 percent uh, and then our critically ill patients that need um, really high concentrations of between 60 to 90 percent may need a non-rebreather mask these people their airways are um, really critical if they're at the point where they need a non-rebreather. Um, also, people um, can use a Venturi mask, and so that delivers uh, a consistent FiO2 regardless of the patient's breathing pattern. So the um, the concentration and the liter flow is marked on the, um, the mask apparatus, and so you can give them 24%. Um, 28%, 31%, 35%, 40%, 50% if you want something specific, if you're trying to get a specific, a consistent um, rate for that individual, you can use that Venturi. And then individuals with a trach, you can have a, um, uh, a tracheal uh, device for individuals with a trach. And so, um, so that they can also receive oxygen. And remember, we said that that oxygen is very drying. So um, you want to, you know, add humidification to, to that because it can dry the mucous membranes. Now, are people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, those individuals are going to get lower rates of um, oxygen no more than two to three liters you don't want more than two to three liters for your individuals with copd a lot of times you may see your orders where the physician will allow those individuals to sat in the upper 80s maybe 88 or low 90s or something like that and so um you don't want anything higher than that because higher values will decrease the level of carbon dioxide in the blood and so a relatively high level of carbon dioxide in the blood is what drives your COPD, COPD patient to breathe that gives them the desire to breathe and so if we reduce that level of carbon dioxide in the blood then that will decrease the patient's desire to breathe and so um if, if they are going to require oxygen, they're not going to get more than two to three liters of, um, of oxygen. Um, like I said, you know, the physician may allow them to set in upper 80s or lower 90s. Okay, tra tracheal um, bronchial suctioning. So we performed the tracheal and trach suctioning in the lab. So as you know, this is um, suctioning to remove suck, remove secretions from uh, the trachea uh, and the bron bronchi. And so as you know, this is a sterile technique for patients that have um, that are um, that have a tracheostomy. Um, and so we want to do uh, pre-oxygenation. We want to hyperoxygenate our patients ahead of time. And remember, it is a sterile technique when we're going down with the suction catheter remember we're not suctioning when we're going down we're only suctioning when we're going coming out of the trachea um, and we're not going until we meet resistance we're only going as long as the trach itself and you don't want to be down in the trachea longer than 10 seconds um, because remember you're cutting off their airway so you don't want to be down there longer than um, 10 seconds. Your suction is going to be set between 80 and um, 120 for these individuals. Okay. So um, also, you know, um, there's one that we didn't do, but it's typically, you know, done like with um, babies that might be, um, you know, really ill or sick or whatever, and they'll do nasal pharyngeal um, suctioning. Um, um, for those um, individuals, but uh, 
So just keep that in mind. If you do need to practice more, you can always go to um, Open Lab to um, practice more on the technique. All right, Linda's patient cannot maintain sufficient amount of oxygen in his body. Linda must administer oxygen to her patient. Oxygen should be administered by, the answer here is going to be for humidify apparatus to prevent drying of the mucosa. So remember, oxygen should be humidified because it's very drying to the mucosa. And so oxygen can be delivered by um, a mask, a cannula, um, a tent, a catheter, a coupette, or a ventilator. So we didn't talk about some of those others, but it can be um, with the physician's order and a flow meter is used to deliver it. Okay, these are the objectives for the next section of this chapter. Okay, so chest tubes, or chest tubes can be used and inserted to remove air or drainage if a person has a um, pneumothorax or hemothorax. A pneumothorax is when the person has air between the chest wall and the lungs. A hemothorax is when the person has blood between the chest, the chest wall and the lungs. So if I had air or blood between my chest wall and my lungs, it doesn't allow me to expand my lungs fully and take in you know, do that exchange of air because my lungs aren't expanding fully, you know, with that. So I need to get that air or blood removed. And so I can use a chest tube to do that. And so um, the drainage device um, would drain that air or uh, fluid, you know, um, out of the chest. And so it could be connected to suction or it could be going by gravity. Um, so you want to keep the drainage system below the, the level of the chest. You're going to keep it a closed system, keep it below the level of the chest. Uh, you want to monitor the person's respiratory status, monitor the chest tubes, make sure the tubes are intact and they're sealed um, appropriately. And then when the tubes are removed, they're going to put an occlusive dressing over that ear, I mean, over that um, area. Um, you know, when it's removed. Now, there's um, in your book, there's a figure 28.15, um, a Heimlich chest drain valve. And basically, that's just, you can see that small uh, little device there. It's a, uh, a small one way valve and it's used for chest, chest drainage as well. And so it just allows for the patient to. Um, you know, be able to ambulate um, as well versus you can see um, that 28.13 uh, with that device, you know, the patient's not, you know, able to ambulate or whatnot. Also on that page, you see a focus um, assessment for your respiratory system. You want to make sure you're doing a focus assessment on their respiratory system. And it just kind of gives you some questions you can ask them. I'm not going to go through all, but just let's see a few of them. When did the respiratory problem begin? Were you exposed to infection? What are the symptoms? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you smoke? Um, what kind of cough do you have? Things like that when you're doing your focus um, respiratory assessment for this individual. So what are ways you as the nurse can help to maintain a patient's airway support? Remember, we said one of our priorities is our ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. So airway is going to be our, our priority. So you always want to maintain a patent airway for your patient. So you want to encourage them to cough and deep breathe um, every two hours um, when they're in bed. Um, if they're immobile, because we want to get those secretions moving around. Uh, stasis of the secretions increases their risk for infection, increases their risk for pneumonia. So surgery patients, patients that are just, um, you know, laying in bed, you know, can't get up and move. 
patients that just have surgery. We want to encourage them to cough and deep breathe every two hours and using that insulin spirometer, encouraging them to use that insulin spirometer as well, because that allows the um, helps the chest wall to expand and get those secretions moving. Surgical patients, they may have some pain, so you can um, encourage them to splint. Use a pillow to splint so that they can still cough and deep breathe, um, as long as it's not contraindicated. Some patients may be contraindicated. We don't want them necessarily coughing, but for the most part, coughing and deep breathing to get those secretions um, moving or whatnot. 